Hey, welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Lucy and the book that I will be reading the first chapter of today is called The Wrong Way Home and this is by Kate O'Shaughnessy. The Wrong Way Home is a story about Fern who is a girl who has spent most of her life that she can recall in this community called The Ranch. It is a self-sustaining community in upstate New York and it is all she knows. She can remember when she and her mother had a different life and they moved around, but the ranch is home for her. It's everything. At the beginning of the book, she and her mother are leaving the ranch and Fern doesn't really understand why. They end up going across the country to a small town in California, which is where Fern's mother is from. And for Fern, she has to learn how to navigate life in what she considers to be a very toxic environment and how to encounter people and even just understand things that we would take for granted because she has been so closed off from the world. As you can imagine, this comes with a big set of challenges. Fern starts to create a plan to get back home, but as she's doing this, it obviously takes some time. It takes money. She also starts to appreciate things about her new life, people she's met, places she gets to go, teachers, uh, the environment around her, and starts to see that there are ways that she can also help the world outside of the ranch. She also has to go through a lot of questioning of everything she knows. The book is really engrossing as we go through all of this with Fern. We're really seeing her heart and soul, and it makes for a really compelling, immersive read. So I will now read the first chapter of The Wrong Way Home. One. Before we came to live at the ranch, mom and I were like tumbleweeds. We never stayed anywhere for more than a year, maybe two, or at least that's how I remember it. Then again, with every passing year, my memories of what life was like before are becoming less and less solid. It's like I'm looking at the past using pieces of a broken mirror. What I do remember, our freezing cold house in Boston with the cracked board on the front porch, our studio apartment in Brooklyn with the half fridge and its mean people suck sticker that was ripped all around the edges because mom tried and failed to peel it off. My friend Mallory, who smelled like strawberries and loved the color pink. I knew her in Buffalo, but I can't remember if we met at our apartment complex or at school. I was six when mom and I came to live here and I'm 12 now. The memories have only grown foggier. A cough from across the room brings me back to myself. When I look down, I realize I've dropped a stitch halfway through the row on the sweater I'm making. A beginner's mistake, stupid. Now I have to go back and fix it. My mind wanders like this sometimes when I'm knitting. I think it's the rhythmic click of the needles, the push and pull of the yarn. Dr. Ben says I need to focus on the work, so that's what I try to do. But then the coughing starts up again, and it sounds even worse than before. It's Iris, one of the adults. She's coughing so hard, one of her knitting needles slides from her lap and clatters to the floor. She's only a little bit older than mom, but since she's been sick, it's like she's aged 30 years. She's gotten so thin, you can see the outline of bones in her hands, and her skin has this yellowish white tint to it, like when you stay in cold water for too long. One of the other women goes over and puts her hand on Iris's shoulder, murmurs something to her, and then helps her stand and walks out of the room. I watch them go, pressing a hand to my chest in sympathy. That cough must hurt. I say a silent prayer that the herbal teas and salves Dr. Ben has her on will start working their magic soon. I put my needles down and take a breath, trying to recenter myself in the present. This is something Dr. Ben does all the time, even if he's in the middle of a conversation. He stops talking, closes his eyes, and breathes in loud and slow through his nose. And then he'll open his eyes and continue right where he left off. I try to do the same thing, but my nose is still too stuffed up from a cold to get much air through. I look around to see if anyone else is struggling to focus right now. The great room is filled with the gentle sounds of needles clicking, along with the occasional snap or pop from the fireplace. 
next to me. Meadowlark is bent almost in half, her nose inches from her work. Her bangs are in her eyes and the tip of her tongue is stuck between her teeth in concentration. She's only knitting a simple hat, but even from here I can see her stitches are uneven. Our seats are by the double windows overlooking the field. It snowed yesterday and the trees are frosted with ice. It's pretty, but as the sun continues to sink, I know Meadowlark will struggle in the fading light. Her up-close vision isn't good, even under the best of circumstances, and it doesn't help that the cold presses through the glass, making our fingers numb and clumsy. Meadowlark reminds me of a cloud. Maybe it's her fine, wispy, white blonde hair, or her pale, almost translucent skin. She's lived here two years longer than I have, and she's a few months older, but for some reason, I feel protective of her. I think it's that not quite there quality of hers, like she could blow away with a strong gust of wind. I tap her gently on the shoulder, meaning to point out her mistakes so she can fix them. But at the last second, when she looks up at me, I stick out my tongue and cross my eyes instead. She smothers a smile, then she clears her throat and closes her eyes, composing herself. When she opens her eyes, she bulges them out and curls her lips so it looks like she's toothless. I stifle a laugh. You look like a possessed turtle. Hold on, hold on, I can do better. The next face she makes is so hideously ugly, so strange, I feel like I'm about to split apart at the seams. Soon we're both shaking with silent laughter. One of the adults shushes us, which only makes us laugh harder. I'm making another face at Meadowlark when the doors to the great room creak. They're wide and wooden, twice the size of normal doors, so they're loud. The clicking of needles stops. Everyone looks up as the doors swing open. It's Dr. Ben. Both Meadowlark and I stop laughing. I grab my needles and start unraveling my last row, the one with the drop stitch. Meadowlark bends over her hat. First, he goes over to the fireplace, where Meadowlark's mom, Dahlia, sits. If Meadowlark is a cloud, her mom is an oak tree, strong and solid. She's got long blonde hair that goes all the way down to her sturdy thick waist and a very pretty face that's been weathered by the sun. She nods at whatever Dr. Ben is saying to her, and then he puts his hand on her cheek for a moment before he continues. They aren't married or anything like that, but they might as well be. She's special to him, and that makes her special to the rest of us, too. He moves among our group quietly, stopping every now and then to expect hats. Stopping every now and then to inspect hats, mittens, sweaters. He drops in like this occasionally. It's never on a schedule. Sometimes he'll surprise us twice in three days. Other times he won't come around for months. I keep glancing up to watch him. Even from a distance, he'd be easy to recognize because he always wears the same thing. A pair of jeans with a worn brown belt and leather hiking boots. In the winter, he wears a sweater one of us has knit, and in the summer, a loose, undyed linen shirt. I'm not the only one who's nervous. I see the flash of eyes all around me, the tucking of hair behind ears and shifting of bodies. Dr. Ben is the leader of our community. If something is broken, he fixes it. If there's a threat to our family, he stands up to it. He's the person who finds compromises and solutions. Everything we have, everything the ranch provides us is because of him. Even the animals seem to respect him the same way the rest of us do. Somehow they just know. As long as you live up to his ideals, life is beautiful. It all makes sense. Soon he comes to a stop next to me and Meadowlark. He turns to her first. May I? He asks, gesturing at her hat. After she hands it to him, she immediately starts chewing on her thumb cuticle. As he turns the hat over, inspecting it, my heart is in my throat. I wish I'd pointed out her mistakes earlier instead of making stupid faces at her. I wish I'd helped her when she still had a chance to fix her mistakes. But he only nods once and gives it back to her. Then he picks up a corner of the sweater I'm working on and rubs it lightly between his fingers. It'll do, he says. But there's room for improvement here, don't you think? I swallow hard. Truth is, I don't like to knit. I'd rather be outside with the men, rounding up the goats and cooping the chickens for the night, feeling hot inside my coat from the effort as my breath fogs out in the cold. Still, his comment stings. I'm glad Meadowlark didn't get in trouble, but I also know my work is much stronger than hers. 
I can do vertical mosaic patterns. I can make all kinds of things, whereas she hasn't graduated from hats yet. So why did he point out my shortcomings and ignore hers? For a second, I think about the way Dr. Ben pressed his hand against Meadowlark's mom's cheek. But no, that's not fair. So all I do is say, yes, Dr. Ben. Because at the end of the day, he's right. There is room for improvement. I have to stop daydreaming and goofing around. I have to focus harder on the work, on my work, because the work is what sustains us. Well, I did come in here for a purpose, not just to distract you all, he adds, in a voice loud enough so everyone can hear. Would you mind joining me in my office for a quick chat, Fern? I have a couple of things I'd like to talk over with you. I point at myself, maybe I misheard him. Me? Yes, you, it shouldn't take too long. After a second, Meadowlark nudges me and widens her eyes. She mouths, go. I accidentally knock my needles to the floor as I stand up. I feel everyone's eyes on me as I bend down to gather them up. And as I trail along behind Dr. Ben. From across the room, mom tilts her head and knits her eyebrows together like she's asking me what's going on. I shrug my shoulders a tiny bit. I have no idea. She frowns and her eyebrows come together even more. Have I done something wrong? I try to figure out what it could be. Did I break something or leave a gate open to the grazing pastures without realizing it? Or is it something worse? As Dr. Ben and I leave the great room, the doors boom shut behind us. I guess I'm about to find out. And that's the end of chapter one, sort of a little suspenseful bit there. The ranch is introduced in this chapter as a place you can see where everyone works hard, they work together, and a place that's run by this man named Dr. Ben. It seems like things go well at the ranch as long as you're listening to Dr. Ben, but if you're not towing the line exactly and doing what he says, that's where things might go wrong. I don't want to give away a lot about the story and what that journey really looks like for them. This is such a very good book. I really, really loved it. I was so immersed in it. I think I read it in about one sitting. I just wanted to know what was going to happen to Fern and how she was going to fit into the world. And also, it was really eye-opening to think about if you'd been completely isolated from the world, what it would be like to be reintegrated and how difficult it might be to let go of a way of thinking, even once someone has told you that it's faulty and that it's incorrect and that you have been lied to. There's a really big ideas for this 12 year old to be going through, but then she's also involved in some great normal 12 year old projects. She gets really involved with a science project and she meets people. So it has all those really good feelings of friendship and found family, which is one of my favorite, favorite things in a book. And this new beautiful environment that Fern is seeing for the first time and Fern is describing for us. So I would urge you to read The Wrong Way Home by Kate O'Shaughnessy. As I said, I really, really loved it. Thank you for joining me.